driving the culture forward. This is Hype Beast Radio. My name is Ben Rosen. I'm a drill Cine. And we are here today with Mark Seekings of Yeezy and the Kanye West camp. How you doing today, Mark? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're excellent, man. Where are we right now? We're at the Standard. I'm just in town for a couple of days. And yeah, I, I, well, we want to give a little bit of context for listeners that might not know this, but, you know, we'll go back in time a little bit, back to, yeah. you know, April of earlier this year. We were setting up, we were getting ready to shoot the first couple episodes of this show. Yeah. We were out in Palm Springs, California, and you were one of the people that we had slated to come on the show. Actually, you were supposed to be like the first episode. <laughs> yeah. And I That's remember, funny. I think it was like we got a text message. It was like, yo, let's uh, let's meet at the Ace Hotel. We met up with you. We had a couple of drinks. And we talked about a whole bunch of stuff that we'll probably touch on in this interview. Yeah. But at the end of it all, you gave us like our first polite no. Yeah. And I think, you know, you should tell the people what you politely declined us for. Um... You know, I, I thought it was really cool and like I was, you know, I was really grateful that you guys reached out and wanted to do it in the first place. Um, you know, because I don't, I don't really post a whole lot of like what I do or, you know, a lot of people kind of don't know because a lot of it's behind the scenes. And, um, you know, I, when we met up, I had this thing planned already slated where I was going to head back to my high school and sort of do this like uh, inspirational talk to the kids where where I grew up and um, once I had met with you guys and you told me the story of what this thing was I was like man this is really really close to what I'm already gonna do and I just thought it was uh, I thought it made more sense to do that first and add a little bit more to to this story because that's something I've been planning for a long time mm -hmm. um, you know and, and it was it was really like meaningful to me to go back and do it and it was so close that I thought like let me get this out of the way and then we can touch on that too so Right, and so you went back to your high school. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in northwestern Pennsylvania, and people, you know, when you say kid, they're like, oh, you're from Philly. And it's super not Philly. It's like in the middle of nowhere. Um, for context, when I fly home, I fly into Buffalo, New York, and drive like an hour and a half right on the border of like northwestern Pennsylvania and western New York. And uh, yeah, it's, there's not a whole lot going on there. It's a very like, it's a very rural area and, and kind of like backwards thinking in terms of like what people think you you can achieve there and, and have as a job and so what were some of the things that when you went back that you kind of wanted to impart on the kids what were some of the lessons that you were kind, I mean, of, I, kind of coming back to talk about yeah it, it's funny because i took this really like sort of strange to a lot of people path where when i was in school there um you know when you get to like 10th or 11th grade they they give you these sort of options of careers you can take in different paths in life and you know, I think a lot of kids can relate to this because not everyone grows up in New York or LA or whatever, major cities. And, you know, I was sort of told like, these are the five things that you can do in life. And it was scary more than anything because like, you know, they were really, really basic careers and, and uh, just things that I wouldn't imagine people dream of when they grow up. Like, I'm gonna dedicate my whole life to this. And, uh, and it was scary for me because I was like, man, is this really all there is? You know what I mean? And uh, all I really cared about growing up from like, man, age like 12 was skateboarding and snowboarding. It's all I did. All my time went there. All my focus was there. And uh, I was sponsored for skateboarding and snowboarding in high school by a local skateboard shop. It's kind of the classic story of how that stuff starts. And I started like later in high school to focus more on snowboarding and um, I was competing, I was traveling uh, and I would go to like the national contests around the US where um, they were like in Mammoth Lakes, California. Uh, there were some on the East Coast at that time and you know, I, I just progressed at it pretty quickly and um, at the end of high school I was like, man, like I. I only look up to pro snowboarders, you know, and like musicians and stuff. But I was like, you know, I think I need to give this a shot. Like, I don't, I don't really want to go to school because I don't know what I would go for. And I really just looked at it like, this would be a big waste of money and a waste of time for me to do this right now. And thankfully, my parents were, were open to me, like moving all the way across the country, literally like coast to coast. And, uh, and going after snowboarding. But at that time, it seems like they were kind of the only ones that 
that nodded yes, you know? And everyone in school was like, man, like, you really, this is what you want to do. You want to be a pro snowboarder. And everyone was choosing the state schools they were going to. And it was, you know, it was, it was a scary moment. Like you either, you know, there's a lot to, there's a lot on the line. Like you could, you could get there and like, you know, no one out, I moved out with like three friends of mine, but get there and know no one and just totally like flop this dream you had. Uh, but yeah, that didn't happen. Um, I was super fortunate to to kind of join the, the main teams that I was sort of flowed product from in high school um, and travel a bit more. And the thing that I went, you know, the really important message I thought going back to high school was like, um, you know, it took me three years and like two years and I got really hurt, shattered my collarbone. It took that to make me start thinking about like, man, what's, what's life after this like having fun for a living thing that I'm doing now? But through it, I was really, I was able to meet these really amazing people who were running the brands, like running the snowboard companies, ad managers, the, the marketing managers, and, and people who had really formed what my opinion was of these brands growing up. And it, they were all like, you know, I think everybody has these, these sort of like companies or brands that make them really, they want to feel like they're a part of it. And like all my allowance went to these these like few companies and I felt so stoked to like have the product and have it in my hands and use it and be a part of that brand and I never really knew why you know I never really knew that like oh shit that's a marketing degree you know that's like when I thought of when I thought of business school you think of like dudes in a bank bankers and like investment people and suits suits <laughs> and uh it was really eye-opening. It was sort of it was sort of a bummer that it took that long, but I don't think it would have been as meaningful once I did go to college and and uh, yeah, that was like kind of the basis of it was, you know, like going back and I I think probably still there's kids there that are being given these options that you don't know, really fit, right? Yeah, it's like it's not it's not a one size fits all thing, and um, you know. It did take me that long to figure it out. It took three years. Yeah, and then and, and, but you got hurt, and then you went to school, right? Yeah, and uh, I went to the Art Institute in San Diego. Um, it's like one of my one of my friends who was kind of on the same team. We met at like this photo shoot in Seattle. Uh, he had left. He left like the the year before I did, and it's after I got hurt. So was, he hit me. He's like, "Dude, I I quit." I was like, what? You're done? Like, what are you doing? And he, um, I was in Mammoth, California, which is like central California. It's in the Sierra Mountain range. And he dipped and he was going to that school for graphic design. And I was like, man, like, I didn't really know much about graphic design, but he's, you know, he's telling me what, what sort of stuff he was working on and it, and it all sounded really cool. And he's like, man, like, come down and visit. Um, maybe you should go visit the school while you're here. So I did, and uh, I ended up hearing about this major, it was like, it was fashion marketing and business management. So it was essentially this degree where like, it's tailored around the apparel industry, but you're also getting like executive leadership courses and like really, you know, like actual business management courses. And it felt like it was a really good balance for me because like, you know, I was like, yeah, fashion, like that's, I'm into that. But at the time I didn't know anything about fashion in hindsight, you know? And, but what I did know is like, I, I always sort of dress a little bit differently within like action sports. And I, I, you know, the companies that I rode for were like very collaborative with artists and musicians. And they were, they were kind of the ones like sort of injecting a little bit more culture into uh into what they were doing so we all kind of dressed a little bit different than like some of these like action sports bozos um and uh yeah and i thought that was fashion and i, I learned really quickly that it was not when i entered these courses and people are talking about all these designers I was like shit i don't know anything about this and it was another one of those moments like man did i just sign up for something that i'm super not ready for but the, like you already paid these people yeah, you know? what was that learning curve like um, I just had to do a lot of research, you know, I think that's how I kind of like really learned uh, 
learned to do a lot of research and pick, you know, like pick up quickly when I didn't know enough. And I remember uh, the first thing, like there's this image that I still have on my desktop. It's um, this image from one of the Dior Ohm shows. I think it's like, I think it's like fall 2005. And I saw this dude and I was like, man, this guy looks exactly, you know, like I wanted to look snowboarding and skateboarding. It was just a better version of like what I, what I thought was cool. And I was like, cool, this is it. Like, this is the dude. And I followed, you know, I followed Hedy's work really closely and became a big fan of his. And, you know, he's really like the person that I would say wanted or made me want to get into fashion and, uh, and made it make sense to me. You know, it was this thing where he was like dressing all the rock stars and like it, but people still looked very normal. It was, it wasn't costuming and it was like, it was influenced by skate. It was influenced by street. It was influenced like, you know, these, these young surf kind of kids from California. And, and yeah, so I, I, fashion school <laughs> sort of made sense then a little bit. Um, so went through school, graduated at the top of my class, which I don't think that's really a thing in art school, but I'll say it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was like another one of these crossroads where I was, I was finishing and, and the same, you know, same thing. I was like, well, I need to work for the brand that like made me feel this way about fashion, made, you know, made it make sense to me. And which was Dior Ohm. Hedy had already left, um, but it was the only brand that really made sense. You know, it was like, if I can be a part of this, if I can be, you know, working around these projects and this, this this product and be a part of it it's like that's what I need to do so I finished um, and I remember my academic director I started telling her what I wanted to do and I, I'd set up some interviews with Dior and I was like well they, they're pretty open they're like the only you know you haven't interned at like a major fashion brand so the only way you can really start out in this is in the store level working retail and I was like not ideal but you know when I met with them it was a super small team and uh, these these couple of people were kind of running all the buying and, and a lot of the PR and and things surrounding the brand for the US market so I was like okay cool if I can get in and sort of make some sort of impression maybe I can move up and maybe I can do a little bit more so I went back and I was super excited I'm like man like I'm gonna work for Dior, I think. Like, I'm gonna work for Dior Ohm. And um, my academic director was like, you, yeah, but like, you cannot work in retail. Like, you cannot, you'll get stuck, and you'll never move up, and you know, all these big dreams of yours, like, I'm sorry, they're like, not gonna happen if you do that. And I was bummed, I was really like, you know, I remember being really conflicted because I felt like this was like, the only place I could go. This is like, there was no other option, you know? And um, and I ended up doing it. Uh, I moved here to New York um, and I started working there. And, you know, it was it was rad, like, but I could, I could see what she was sort of saying. Like, it became pretty apparent that uh, even the, the little promises they made about moving up and going into the corporate office, like, it wasn't easy, yeah. you know. There were a lot of like struggles there to get to get where I thought I was gonna be. Um, yeah, so I was there for like I was there for about three years. And then you kind of had some some conflicts with them, right? There was kind of like a couple moments where you were what were what were some of the situations like the sticky moments when you were working at Dior? Um, I mean, I just hit like this this sort of glass ceiling pretty early in, you know, it, it was, I was really psyched to be there. And one of the, you know, um, I met a lot of really amazing people there, like people coming into the store. And like I said earlier, the team was really small and I was sort of like able to like leapfrog into this, like this role where we would kind of handle the PR, you know, and the, and the cool thing about that was there were all these people that Diorum was dressing at the time that were like people I'd looked up to for a long time, you know, and all these, right away it was like super, uh, all these people that I'd, that I'd seen before 
right in front of you and, and uh, you know, we were, there were only a few of us, so we'd establish a relationship with like, you know, whoever, whoever it might be and you're sort of the point person. Yeah. So it was, it was really, uh, it was kind of surreal at first. Um, and that's sort of how, you know, not sort of, that's how I ended up working on all the other things post Dior and the things I'm working on now. That was the foundation to me, like for me to meet all these people. So you met Kanye when you were at Dior? Yeah, yeah. As just um, like someone that came into the store or? Yeah, I mean, what was, it was during the era of like, um, my beautiful dark twisted fantasy, like that's, he, that had just come out or was just about to come out. So he was, he was in New York a lot. Um, and that was wild because it was like Virgil would come in, Don C would come in and, and these are all guys that I'd obviously followed before and was a big fan of. And, uh, you know, and also like, uh, Dave Maklovich, who be one of, like one of my best friends now, he, in the band Chromio, he was coming in a lot. And it was just, like, it all happened in like a week. And I was like, yo, like, this is, this is crazy, you know? Um, and then, uh, there was like a lot, there were, there were all these like really cool sort of private moments happening around the album, uh, Dark Fantasy, and there were like pop-up shows and these, you know, Virgil and, and Don and those guys were like cool enough to, to invite me, you know, they're like, yo, do you want to like come to this thing tonight? There's, it's not ticketed, it's just like, just show up and we'll get you in. I'm like, geeked out, you know? So ended up going to those sorts of things and just kind of being around, just being, just being present and like just stoked to see a little glimpse of this world. Um, so to answer your question in sort of long format there, uh, the first real like conflicting scenario with Dior is, you know, I'd been around that crew of guys enough where, um, Virgil had like looped me in and, and uh, we worked on a couple small projects together and you know I'd, I'd got to meet Kanye and he was doing that first APC collab and they hit me and they're like yo do you, can you come to Paris like tomorrow and that was sort of the start of it and you can't say no you know it's a crazy yeah. text message yeah. You know what I mean? yeah 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 and you can't I couldn't say no to it but I was a little worried because it's obviously like another French fashion house or fashion brand. And so I told him I was like going on a vacation or something and, and I dipped out and went. And um, yeah, that was sort of the start of it. You know, that was sort of the start of like me entering this, this world that I'm, you know, that I'm working in now. In that time of like freelancing in New York, I did like two stage designs for the tours of Chromio. Um, we did this installation around the corner here actually at Milk Gallery with Daniel Arsham for uh, an album launch with Chromio. And, and uh, I was just kind of working on all these projects trying to figure it out, you know? Um, and that's sort of like one of the things with the high school talk was, I did all these things that are like on paper mistakes, you know? and. It wasn't like that interesting to talk about until I finally got to the place where I felt okay about doing the high school talk, which was, uh, yeah, earlier this, it was like in May. Um, you can't really talk about it until people know some of the things you've done and they're like, oh shit, that was really rad and I saw that, you know? Like, it's cool and it's aspirational to some people to be a pro snowboarder. And it was certainly fun and I got to travel a lot and, and do really cool things, but it doesn't really relate to everyone. But, you know, when you get to a space where you're putting out, like, really well-known projects in a pop culture sphere, people see it and it's like, oh, okay, wow, like, even though you did all these things and, like, made all these really sort of crazy choices and moves, there's an element of it that, like, quote-unquote, worked out, you know? So what motivated you, like, you know, to continue pursuing like, you know, your goals during a time where everyone thought that each step was, like, very far-fetched. Yeah, it was hard in New York because, you know, it's not cheap to live here. And I was, you know, like, the same thing with going into retail. I was sort of hanging on to this feeling that was getting more and more daunting by the day of, like, 
you know, I'm paying this crazy rent here, like, I haven't figured out exactly what it is or like a way to pull this off and work as, you know, work as a creative and not go back to another fashion brand or like another whatever retailer. And uh, and it got to the point where I was like, man, what, like, what am I going to do? You know, like reality hits pretty quickly and you're like, okay, well, I need to do something because I'm not like moving back and living with my parents in Pennsylvania. Right. And um you know, persistence, like I just kept, I just kept pushing at it and uh, working on more and more projects. And, you know, I think one of the, it's, it, it wasn't a smart thing to do, but, but it worked in this scenario. Like I wasn't willing to, to work on things that were whack, you know, like I just wasn't. And it was just this mentality of like, I'd rather go broke and like have to figure it out in an even crazier scenario than like put my name on, on something that's just in my eyes lame. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was certainly like a struggle of, of dipping and like not having anything figured out at all. I think yeah. one of the most difficult parts about being like that sort of like the creative person mm -hmm. is that it's really hard to describe what it is you do to yeah. people that are outside of like a creative mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, for you, if you're stuck in that freelance in between bit, it's like you can always pull the you know Kanye West affiliate card. But people, mm. I guess, sort of like from an outsider looking in, the question is always like, what? How would you describe what you do within yeah. the organization? Um, on music projects, it's sort of like an art director role. So uh, depending on who it is, but with Kanye, it's like we did all the Life of Pablo merch and the pop-ups that you guys probably saw, and. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not like trained in music, so it's definitely more on the art side of that. And, and he's, you know, he's really great about choosing these awesome artists to collaborate with, like Kondo, Wes Lang, Callie DeWitt. Um, and in my role with that, it was sort of like just being the point person with Callie and making sure that like everything was, was signed off on on both sides and everybody felt good about it coming out by the time it did. Um, and on the fashion side, it's more of like a brand, you know, brand direction role. And just sort of, we've established this language with the website and everything that's coming out, all the, just the brand side, where like, you know, there's a couple of, of us who vet everything before it gets to the final sign off and, and just making sure that everything looks and, and feels how, you know, how we talked about for years feels like this sort of dream that that we all had so talk about that period you know bef like after leaving Dior and then working for yourself mm -hmm. like you know just just how was that feeling from like working on a very big project with Kanye West on APC yeah. and then like you know being told that oh you can't do that yeah and it's like all right well now I got to do this by myself like how was that it was hard you know like it's funny because like you're sort of doing this really on paper like glamorous thing and then it's sort of like is gone for a while and you're like left to figure out like how to still hang on to that feeling you know it's like it's such a high when you get to do things like that and then you know real life is sort of like a hangover <laughs> if you will and it, it was you know I guess it is like an element of fake it till you make it you know like I was able to work on really dope projects, but there was a lot of downtime to figure it out in between. And it was, um, you know, I was fortunate that that I met people who were willing to like give me a shot and give me a chance. And and uh, all the people I've worked with, it's like they're very um, they're very very loyal people, you know. And they knew the situation I was in, you know. Like, there'd be moments where Dave and I would go to brunch and it's like, dude, like, we got you. Like, whatever comes up, like, you're going to be on it, you know? But it was, it was a, it was a strange period too because everyone was sort of in this off cycle, like recording or like not, not working on the things that we might have done in that set period. Like, it was, it was a trend, like music and music particularly works in, you know, on a schedule where like, the Cycles. album comes out, you do yeah, the tour, you the whole like cycle. all these moments, and then there's downtime to get back to that again with the next project. And, mm -hmm. and this sort of like, 
move that I made just so happened that like the people I was working with were sort of on an off schedule in a time where I needed it to be very on. Um, so yeah, it was just trying to trying to figure out how to like hang on, and yeah. thankfully, it, you know, thankfully it worked out. But um, another, you know, thing about like that period at Dior was like, you know, I met these people as a like glorified retail employee, you know, and and I think there's something to be said about specifically those two dudes and like uh, and Virgil really seeing something where like because people don't give people shots at a very like low level and say like you know what like I see something about you like come on let's 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 try to work on something together and I think there's really something to be said about uh, people operating off of like just a gut feeling and like chatting with someone and getting along and then like be willing because that's a huge risk you know like giving me that shot is a huge risk and thankfully I you know, it ended up working out to some degree. Mm. But um, yeah, it really happened from there. Like people were more willing to give me that shot. I liked what you said about like the loyalty of that entire crew as well. Cause I think there is sort of like a tight knit community. Yeah. What, how much can you like tell us about like the early days of like the whole, like the formation of Donda? Cause you've been involved since, since the get go, it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, dude, it's, it's crazy. It's funny being back in New York because like, I'll have these flashbacks to that period and, and it was all just really super exciting to me. But I remember being at uh, at this sushi spot in Soho with uh, with my buddy KJ and the tweets came out. And I was like, holy shit. Like, this is very real, you know? And, uh, and we, we were just watching it happen. We were watching this stream happen of just like the most inspiring thing I'd probably ever felt, you know? And um, yeah, it's like that moment, that's what, and like that was the feeling that made me um, absolutely have to go back and do the high school thing. You know, it was that, it was our chats about like, you know, it's really rad to be in this position to do like big, cool like great projects but you know it, it like I learned from sort of my interactions with Kanye specifically like you need to do more like if you're in this position of, of influence or power whatever you want to call it you better use it for good and I knew then like and it, this this thing is like still something I'd like to do I'd like to do more of those sort of talks and you know I knew that if I went back there and people hear it from me. Like, I know what it was like to sit in that room, you know? I sat there. And there certainly wasn't anything like the talk I did there, but I felt like going back there and doing that, uh, if I can make one person, like, I, I definitely think there were some of, like, the me's in that room. And if I can make one person have the balls to, like, do all the crazy shit that I did and make it a little bit easier, like, inject some sort of confidence into a situation like that, like, it was a total win. I mean, you texted me the story about some of the kids that were reaching yeah. out to you afterwards, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounded yeah, like yeah. you had the exact effect that you wanted, right? Yeah, it was, you know, it was pretty overwhelming. Like, a lot of people reached out. Yeah, wasn't there that one kid that literally was, like, reached out to you, emailed you, and sent you all of his stuff and everything? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like that's... And, it, you know, it's like people you know you never you never really know how like someone working in like a high profile scenario whatever the career may be is going to react and it's like you know obviously these guys are busy obviously like they're not going to reply to me but um you know with like me hoping that would happen like i got on the phone with the kid you know he's like man like I'd love it if you could reply to this text. And I was like, no, nah, like, let's talk right now, you know? Because that's the, those are the chances that I was given. And that's why, like, my situation... has come out the way that it has, right? Yeah, his, his kind of, has worked out this way is because, like, I met people who were literally the top of the top, top, top. And they were just very normal, you know? And it's like, there was no sort of, like, pseudo... Um, Pseudo, like being, 
putting on this 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 face that you're way busier and way more important than you are. It's like all these guys were really like super humble, normal people. It's like, yeah, let's just chat now. It's all good. Come on. Like it was it was rad, and I think that's why like it's so important that I never lose that. You know, if like if there's a little bit that I can do to like you know help a kid out who's in the same scenario I was like. So what's been like the when you're talking to kids and kind of helping them understand that you know success in creative arts and creative industries and stuff isn't really a straight path what's been like one of the like episodes that stood out to you as something that you can learn from and something you can teach people to you know work with yeah i mean i think it's just like persistence like if you have this idea of getting somewhere like give it everything and don't let anyone say like you know that fashion director said like i can never move up from retail you know, and, and I think just never losing sight, this sounds like sort of cliche, but never losing sight of this bigger dream. And the, the thing about being back there is it's like, you know, I think if you're like under 30, like you should be taking every risk because chances are you don't have like some crazy mortgage. You don't have kids, you don't have a family to worry about and support. And you can afford to take the L. Like you can take an L and like it doesn't shatter your whole life. And uh, you know, there were these people that had inspired me along the way that made me realize like I had to take these risks. I, risks. I had to get to this place. And, and uh, yeah, I think just like never losing sight of, of your highest dream. And um, if you're aiming at that and you land somewhere a little bit below it, you're still gonna be way happier than someone who like goes to school and starts a job that they have no interest in at all. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a good, that was a good take on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we spoke with um, Heron Preston, like, you know, in a prior episode. Yeah. And he mentioned, like, you know, just those transitional periods in his creative journey. Yeah. Feeling almost like graduating in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've heard, like, Tremaine Emery, like, reference Kanye University as being, like, an actual, like, universe, university in a sense, yeah. too, where there's, like, alumni yeah. going on to do bigger and better things yeah. um, as well. So, like, I mean, like, what, what, I just want to get your thoughts on that, too. Like, you know, if that's, like, you know, a concept that you believe in, just being someone that's transitioned through, like, so many different crea creative paths. Yeah. Um... I mean, I certainly believe in it. Like it's, it's really, you know, it's like, it's like getting, you know, an MBA in outer space, like you're not prepared for it. And like, it's just literally the craziest, like, uh, you're thrown these tasks that are just like amazing dream projects to work on. And you have to, you have to figure it out. Like no one's really, when you the thing about like the work that he's done he's innovating with every single thing and that means that like if it's brand new no one's done it before and you're not really supposed to know exactly how to do it and i've learned more through that than than anything else in life you know it's like it's literally this school that you know you can't even imagine you can't buy it's like yeah being able to work on those things, you just learn so much and so quickly. Yeah, I think Heron used the phrase, he was like, yeah, we had to be like a creative army and just literally do whatever we were told to do, like follow yeah. orders. Yeah. And from what, from like, again, the outside looking in, it seems like you guys were like learning on your on your feet. Yeah. Basically, like, it would I mean, like all those, all those really cool things that surrounded the apparel when, when it first started coming out, like the season one and all the, the sort of invites and stuff like that, like, you know, it was changing by the minute and uh, we just had to figure it out and it was rad like it was things like that are really stressful but when you look back on it it's like you can't buy that you can't pay for that in school you know it's like yeah it's 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 the most valuable like set of experiences I've ever had for sure yeah and I mean we, we really like to kind of almost it's tough because you had literally you've gone to high school you've talked to kids about this you've mm -hmm. had the conversation with teenagers and yeah. and you've been trying to impart this wisdom I think on us in this conversation too yeah. but it's like if you had to condense that talk into like a short answer like what kind of advice could you give for the you know the aspiring Mark Seekings in your town in Pennsylvania to kind of like what's if you could crystallize it if you break it down to like 
yeah, a bullet point. How would you, what would be the advice that you gave to like 13 year old Mark? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's not for everyone. You know, it's not like a one size fits all equation. And, and I think like, with that said though, there are people that have really big dreams and have really like amazing minds and, you know, and can pull these things off. And I think that if you feel that about yourself and you feel like there's no other sort of, there's no other answer for you to get to where you want to be in life. It's, is this like really broad, you know, seemingly unrealistic thing that you need to do, you're probably right and you need to do it. And there's going to be a lot of people who have never thought that way. And those are going to be the people that say like, how dare you think you can do that? Like, how dare you try to take this on? Because it's just not a realistic thing in their head. And I think, you know, if you have this, this, this idea of your own personal success, you need to just power through it and you can't really take no from anyone. Yeah, it's kind of like when the when the academic advisor or whatever is telling you, yeah. like, hey man, don't work in retail. It's like the way that you tell the, your story, it's like there's a ton of foreshadowing right yeah, there. Yeah, I got asked to come back there too, which I'm honored. Yeah, would you I'm do honored. it? Would you do it for college kids too? Yeah, man, I think like, you know, I think we've been talking, I've been talking about it with a couple friends um, and I'd like to do something that's, that reaches more people like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny just the, the kind of like, you know, like the juxtaposition of those two things being told, like, you're probably like not going to be successful and then being asked to come back. And I don't think anyone from my graduating class was asked to come back. Um, but the high school thing was, it just meant so much more, you know, like I think, um, I think at college age, you, you probably do have people that you look up to and you, you do sort of have a better, more clear idea of of how to get where you want to be or like what your dreams are. But it, in high school, especially growing up in a, in a rural area where there those industries don't exist. So you've yeah. definitely never met anyone that's doing what you dream of doing. Um, I just felt that it was it was way closer to me to go do it there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, really, I think and hopefully this episode is kind of like part of that. This kind of helps bring that that idea, that message yeah. to a lot more people. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm stoked that you guys asked me to do it because that's kind of the way I looked at it too. And once you told me sort of the premise of of what this dialogue is, I was like, I was pretty stoked. And that's why I said I needed to do the high school thing first because I, I see this as like sort of an extension of it where it's, you know, can hopefully get that message out to a lot more people yeah i mean it's a, it's a long time coming man but thank you so much for finding a little bit of time on your whirlwind <laughs> yeah, yeah, weekend yeah. dude thank you guys thanks, thanks really for dropping by it. yeah oh yeah Excellent.